Uh, thank you, Prashant, and thank you, uh, Team Business World, uh, for inviting me uh, for this keynote. Uh, I, I also had the honor of uh, being the jury chair uh, for the Golden Cart Awards. Uh, so I'd like to thank my uh, fellow uh, jury members. I guess some of them were there today with you. Uh, we had uh, good fun judging, uh, I think, close to 60 uh, entries. Uh, and it was, yeah, it was actually quite insightful. Uh, going through all the entries and looking at the kind of work uh, happening in the e-com space. I know I stand between uh, you and uh, the award, so I'll just keep this uh, very brief. I thought what I'll share with you, uh, you know, are uh, some trends, interesting uh, data uh, that we've got from uh, some of our internal reports at WPP, uh, as well as Cantar. And uh, of course, some of our learnings in terms of, uh, you know, how brands could capitalize on this uh, e-com wave. Uh, I'm sure you've had uh, lots of experts come, uh, you know, and, and, and share their insights with you. And I was listening in very keenly on the last panel discussion. Uh, and uh, so maybe this is a session that will, in a way, uh, sum things up uh, as far as e-com and the opportunity of e-com is concerned. Uh, so let me start by, uh, you know, sharing, uh, I always like to start with some numbers, uh, just to kind of put things in perspective. Uh, so some recent numbers I pulled out to, to try and see uh, what has the pandemic really done uh, for us uh, when it comes to uh, people adopting, uh, first of all, digital as a medium, and then beyond that, people getting on to e-com. Uh, so, uh, and, and, you know, what is really behind the numbers? What do those numbers uh, uh, tell us what is the story behind those numbers. Uh, now, in terms of, uh, we all know, in terms of uh, people just migrating to uh, digital as a medium, uh, you know, post pandemic, the numbers have shot up. In fact, uh, as of 2021, we have close to 700 million active uh, consumers on the internet. And that number is expected to hit about 900 million, between 900 million and a billion by uh, 2025. Uh, so we're, we're actually covering almost the majority of the population. And it's interesting to note that since the outbreak of the pandemic, the number of uh, e-com users India has added has gone up by 51%, uh, 51% growth uh, you know, on, on, on e-com in terms of number of users. And if you actually dig into the numbers, it's very interesting to see where the growth has come from. Most of the growth in the last one and a half, two years have come from rural towns and have come from lower NCCS segments. Uh, and it's also very heartening to note that, uh, you know, there has been a massive growth in uh, the female uh, consumer, uh, you know, getting onto uh, e-com and e-com platforms. Uh, in fact, there was a bit of a skew a uh, couple of years ago, and uh, our data is telling us that across both urban and rural India, those skews are kind of uh, vanishing now, and it's almost... Uh, you know, equal in terms of, uh, you know, uh, e-com kind of usage. So, which is, which is a, which is a very good sign. Uh, if one looks at the drivers of uh, e-com uh, in India, uh, you know, very clearly what has, uh, I mean, obviously the, the pandemic and, you know, people being at home and, you know, uh, some, some years ago, the fact that, you know, data prices crash, you know, all of that has a, has a role to play. Uh, but apart from all of that, uh, you know, online finance, uh, we, we, we think has been the biggest driver. And this, of course, includes digital payments. And this whole digital payment revolution has really helped, uh, you know, fast track growth. In fact, 37% of urban India today uses uh, e-wallets and UPIs as per, uh, as per our data. And, and therefore, you know, going on from there, which is digital payments and, and online finance, online shopping and, uh, you know, the rate at which that has grown. In fact, uh, since the pandemic started, online shopping has grown 64%. And uh, today, one in three internet users uh, in India is a regular online shopper. These numbers were very, very different a couple of years ago, as, as all of us know. And... Uh, you know, there are a lot of things that have happened post pandemic and uh, we often get asked, uh, you know, which are the changes that will stick and which are the changes uh, that are transient. Uh, we don't think uh, this migration to online shopping is transient. We think it's here to stay and we can see it all around us. Brands are now adopting an omni-channel strategy and ensuring that they pay as much attention to online as they do to, to offline. And everything else, of course, is trying to play uh, catch up in that sense. Uh, the other interesting part uh, of the Kanta study was in terms of uh, the number of urban monthly shoppers. Uh, in the last couple of years, it's actually increased uh, 2x. 
so that again shows uh, you know what uh, what really has happened in terms of uh, adoption of ecom now if you if you go through the categories that are popular on ecom and if you go back in time last 4 5 years you know the order hasn't changed very much for the top two players it's uh, clearly fashion which still leads the way followed by uh, mobile phone and accessories and i think uh, india is a mo- mobile crazy market uh, in terms of purchase uh, and that continues but uh, very surprisingly groceries has now moved up to the third position uh, it's the third most uh, bought uh, or consumed uh, product or service on on ecom the numbers are quite startling actually uh, in and, and you know again this is from the cantar iqube study one out of every two grocery shoppers actually comes from towns of less than 5 lakh uh, population so uh, so there are two things here it's not just groceries come up to number 3 but uh, almost half of the shoppers are actually coming from the smaller towns earlier as we know it was pretty much dominated by the top 8 metros which is why we are seeing a lot of uh, players uh, go into hyper local uh, uh, areas and i, th- I think hyper local is again a, a trend that we've seen especially uh, post the pandemic uh, you know people going to uh, uh, people ensuring that there are uh, you know neighborhood stores which are enabled uh, you know via via ecom and, and delivery actually happens in in micro geographies uh the other interesting point to note is micro and small businesses uh, you know they the so called msme sector uh, you know they also uh, getting on to the ecom bandwagon in in a big way in fact uh, again as per our report uh, about 23% of uh, msme businesses in india currently offer their products and services online and we all know that the msme number uh, goes into uh, uh, in, in many hundred thousands millions perhaps it's a, it's a, it's a massive segment so 23% of that already uh, you know on on to ecom and again it's indexed higher in tier 2 and 3 towns uh, you know rather than the tier 1 cities uh, if you look at the next couple of years uh, you know what could be the key, key growth drivers uh, for ecom hyper local like we already mentioned but apart from that uh voice uh, we're seeing increasing usage of voice and uh, i think it was mentioned today in in some of the earlier sessions as well and and of course languages uh, indic languages uh, would, would probably be the three uh, you know factors by which uh, you know this this uh, uh, this segment is going to grow uh, one cannot uh, you know uh, uh, conclude a talk on ecom without talking about social commerce right we've seen uh in fact in china in the last few years uh it's actually become kind of mainstream uh to to commerce uh in india it's still uh, i mean you can see it's at a nascent stage because uh, again as per our findings uh, currently social commerce contributes less than 5% of the total ecom uh, gmv uh, at about you know uh, 1.5 billion is is what we estimated to be at but again very very interestingly uh, you know a lot of the social commerce users come from tier 2 and 3 cities uh, therefore vernacular languages like i mentioned earlier is really fueling this growth and uh, yeah it's very interesting because it's it's uh, uh, you you actually buying products and services basis uh, you know people you trust and and research has shown that uh, you know recommendations uh, are as as important if not slightly more than uh, pricing and discount on on social commerce Uh, again we did a uh, we did a study uh, through one of our group m agencies essence uh, this is a global study done recently this is done in 2021 across i think uh, 11 markets of uh, 2000 odd individuals specifically on social commerce we got some very interesting insights just just to share some top lines with you uh, again uh, the the top categories uh, you know across markets uh, seem to be beauty and and uh, fashion related nearly 40% and uh, followed by uh, food uh, delivery and takeaway at at 30% obviously in a way related to uh, you know the kind of uh, you know social uh, influence uh, that helps uh, you know in 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 uh, such products uh, moving uh, and the other interesting point is on on live shopping again we're beginning to see uh, some of this happen in india uh globally across those markets that we surveyed 85% of the respondents who watch shopping live stream uh said they were more likely to purchase uh, via social media so i mean we've seen this in india as well right we've seen mintra's uh, m live uh, the live shopping uh, experience with experts uh, we also seen the short video app uh, mojo's partnership with flipkart and and yes of course inmobi's roposo also pivoting into live commerce so these are some of the things that are 
going to catch on in a big way in the next uh, couple of years. Uh, and if one digs a little deeper into China, which really is uh, the lead market when it comes to social commerce, some interesting uh, points to note, which probably will be the way we will go as well. One is the group buying model, uh, which is really matured uh, in China. In fact, there are different platforms for shopping with family and friends uh, and, and, and for shopping through neighborhood groceries, etc. So group buying in India is still at a, at a nascent stage. So that's a big growth driver in China. Uh, in China, you also have chat-based commerce, which in fact, uh, some studies say is about 90% of social commerce. Uh, so this, this again, perhaps will have a, a, a different trajectory of growth in India. And uh, cultural events like Singles Day, again, are uh, largely taken over by, by social commerce uh, in, in, in China. So, uh, yeah, and then, of course, uh, there is B2B commerce as well. Uh, we won't get into it today, but uh, I guess all of us are aware, are aware of uh, the kind of activity happening in India. Uh, in this space, and it'll be very interesting to see. Uh, I, I actually think uh, B2B commerce is a space where uh, we'll probably uh, be leading the world in terms of innovation, given the uh, complex and heterogeneous uh, market that we have as uh, in terms of the way retail and trade is organized. And, uh, you know, we are aware of, uh, you know, the kind of efforts, uh, uh, some of the, not just the startups are taking, but even some of the more established companies are taking in trying to digitize uh, you know, uh, uh, channels uh, to, to, to the retail and trade outlets. So that's a space which is exciting. And uh, in fact, the kind, the, the way the whole ecosystem is coming to, to you know, along with payments and everything else uh, makes it uh, very interesting. And I think a, a very unique model is going to kind of emerge uh, in India uh, as far as B2B is concerned. Uh, okay, so with all of this happening uh, with e-com, uh, you know, what, what is it that we're seeing uh, as, as uh, good, you know, practices or lessons uh, from brands? Uh, and if you kind of expand this a bit to say D2C brands uh, or brands which are kind of uh, digitally first, uh, you know, there are four or five things that stand out, right? I think one is in terms of uh, the way these brands see the marketing funnel versus the way a more traditional or a legacy brand would see the marketing funnel. So digital native brands are the ones who, yeah, you know, they, they try and over-index visibility uh, during the active stages of uh, the consumer journey, uh, you know, which, which uh, leads to conversations. And uh, I mean, you can say they sometimes flip the pyramid the other way, but uh, they spend a lot of time and energy trying to perfect that uh, and, and, and really be at that moment of, of purchase and maximize visibility there. Uh, the other, of course, is uh, I would say it's more organizational and 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 culture related. The the kind of agility and speed with which these brands operate. Uh, we've seen a number of brands, D two C brands, uh, you know, become hundred crore, two hundred crore brands in like three four years, or, or even lesser these days, uh, compared to uh, you know what uh, legacy brands uh, do or have done. Uh, and and I think a lot of it is because of uh, the agility and speed, uh, the flexibility in their approach and the way these organizations, uh, you know, kind of work. And, uh, and, and of course, building a brand through user experience and conversations uh, rather than just uh, visibility. Uh, we've seen at times legacy brands take the conversation route, uh, maybe to manage a crisis, but uh, I think it's built into the DNA of, uh, of, of, of the digital brands. Uh, and I think these are some of the areas where uh, they've kind of, you can say, turned uh, classical marketing uh, media planning, or whatever you would like to call it, on its head uh, to kind of build a business uh, the other way. But having said all of that, is that uh, you know, is that uh, the golden rule going forward? Uh, I'm not sure because at the end of the day, uh, you know, we all talk about brands that succeeded, and rarely do we look at uh, you know brands or enterprises that have failed. And we all know that uh, for every two or three uh, brands that really make a mark in any particular segment of e-com. There'll be hundreds of others who who haven't made it, right? Uh, so uh, uh, yeah, so I think it's important to kind of balance uh, what we just spoke about. You know, the agility, the flexibility, the focus on uh, you know the the uh, purchase moment of the consumer journey, the focus on um, conversations and so on. I think we need to balance that with uh, you know uh, uh, some of the good old fashioned uh, principles of of creating enterprise value. Uh, there's no running away from ensuring that uh, you know you invest in the right talent. Uh, we have seen many a time, uh, you know, once uh, a, a business reaches a certain scale or a startup reaches a certain scale, uh, it's unable to kind of uh, really go beyond that. And many times it just boils down to lack of kind of leadership bandwidth 
so how do you kind of ensure that your leadership, uh, uh, you know, kind of uh, uh, is there across uh, all the different functions? So talent, uh, the, the kind of culture uh, that you need to build in the organization, uh, the fact that you need to have uh, purpose, uh, and, and of course, other things like ensuring you have uh, the supply chain, ensuring you have the ability to navigate policy, uh, which uh, in this space uh, kind of frequently keeps changing. So I think it's a lot of that as well. And uh, if one uh, probably analyzes why there are only two or three or maybe at max four successful players uh, in any of these sub-segments uh, and, and, and looks, at, looks at the reasons, I think it's more of these that will come out uh, than anything else. So I think at the end of the day, it's, uh, one needs to kind of balance out both uh, to ensure that uh, as a brand, you create value uh, in, this, in this new world order. So those were just... Uh, some key, uh, you know, trends from from our internal reports and uh, some some learnings uh, that I'd like I wanted to share. Uh, so yeah, with that, it's uh, it's back to the organizers. And again, thank you, Business World, for uh, having me as uh, part of this event. <laughs>